Capson and Baltum, John Nosta. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm going to put my notes promptly on here and walk, walk right off the stage. So here's the story. The guy was Jimmy, and Jimmy played with me in high school. And I live right down the road from New Brunswick, New Jersey. Everybody, you know, the J&J &J folks. And as it turned out, Jimmy's last name, I found out, was Burke. Can you ring a bell yet? Well, Jimmy Burke's father, James Burke, was the CEO of Johnson & Johnson. So that, that's kind of the interesting story. The other guy in my class who actually got thrown out was John Bon Jovi. People really want to hear that story. John Bon Jovi grew up in central New Jersey. So um, I want to spend about 45 minutes or so chatting with you about what's going on in the world today. I want, to, I want to look at things from a philosophical perspective. So I want to talk about these things called exponential growth, digital health, artificial intelligence. But I also want to look at it from a pragmatic perspective. I run a think tank that looks at the life science industry in the context of exponential change and growth. And I spend all my time thinking about that. So while I might be a bit of a philosopher, I'm also, I want to speak to you today as a techno-optimist. As a techno-optimist. I'm a big believer in the role of technology in changing the world as we know it, but I'm also very, very well acquainted with things like cybersecurity and HIPAA. But I'm going to sort of sidetrack that a little bit because I think it's important as we talk today that we kind of have an optimistic perspective. So I'm going to be a cyber optimist if that's okay with you. Anybody here know what their IQ is? I'm not going to ask you, but anybody know? Everybody knows conceptually what IQ is. Everybody here knows conceptually what EQ is. We all want our children to be smart, but we also want our children to be empathetic. And it's that combination of EQ and IQ it's really interesting. But I proposed recently in Psychological Today that there's another thing called TQ. And TQ will become extraordinarily important. And that's our technology quotient. Our intrinsic ability to assimilate technology into our lives will be a function of our success. Think about that for a minute. Think about the physician who's out of practice for five or ten years. Let's say she has a child who wants to stay. She comes back into the clinical arena, but is unfamiliar with certain diagnostic modalities, or unfamiliar with the electronic medical record that we use today. Or a marketer who doesn't understand how to do SEO or other aspects of technologically based marketing. So I believe that our ability to assimilate technology can be quantified and measured. It's going to be important. You might want to quantify your audience that way. Is this physician very technologically sad? Can I go in and have a high tech discussion? We're going to have to dial it down, have a low tech so this is something that I've been thinking about. I've heard a lot of people talking about the ability of processing technology in that context. I think it's an important and evolving concern. The other thing that's interesting, and this is data that just came out of, uh, just was published the other day, is that the internet is making us lose trust in our doctor. Lose trust in our doctor. Anyone here read the book by Malcolm Gladwell called Blink? It's a great book. It talks about social priming, intellectual priming. If I tell you something ahead of time, it will impact the task that you do subsequently. Now, this data has been refuted. It's hard to reproduce, so I'm not going to tell you that's definitive. But what this study found is that if people have a particular predisposition by reading information on the internet, when they go to the doctor, their likelihood of agreeing or building a relationship with that clinician is a function of what they read online. So if they read information that agrees with the physician, they like the physician. If they read information that disagreed with the physician, they don't. So we are actually priming ourselves by what we read on the internet. And that's an interesting dynamic from a social perspective, also from a marketing perspective. So these are just two kind of cutting edge things that I want to talk a little bit about, about today. Just down the road from here um, is the annual meeting of Singularity University, the Exponential Medicine Organization. If you've never been to that, it's a great meeting run by Dr. Daniel Pratt. And this is some of the chatter that came from that meeting. And the reason I want to talk to you about this is because when we talk about digital health, it's not about activity trackers. And it's not about apps as much as you'd like to spend time about apps. Really, the resonant discussion there, the heat, the excitement, is about things like artificial intelligence. I'm going to talk a good deal about that. It's about nanoparticle mediated early cancer detection. These are the areas that are really exciting. And that's a lot of the chatter that we do when we go to what I consider to be the definitive meeting around med medicine and technology. 
nanotech, biotech, neuromedicine, robotics, medical education, AR and VR. So these are the things that should be on your radar conceptually when we talk about digital health. By the way, how many people here have an activity tracker on? Okay, a few. I like to call them dust collectors. I'll tell you more about that later. <laughs> we started our day with a group interaction um, where we talked about collaboration, a collaborative experience with late they know. And that's sort of the third leg of my discussion that I'm going to end my talk with because I think the nature of collaboration in the world we live in today is extraordinarily precarious and it's being neutered by one fundamental practice. So I'm going to tease you out on that. But that's very, very important in an evolving concept. So here's the takeaway, okay? You're lucky to be alive today. This is the most important thing that I can tell you. Today is a true and profound inflection point in human history. Everything's changing. And it's changing extraordinarily rapidly. Now, if you want to kind of make this less of a cartoon and a little bit more granular, we can put stuff in there. We can start with Gutenberg on one end. The printing press. What did Gutenberg do? He disseminated information in a printed form. A game changer. Information was no longer the domain of the elite. And we're seeing a fundamental analogy to that today, but we're seeing it happening at a very, very quick pace. The acceleration in growth in technology is what's changing the world, and it's also quite disruptive. So accelerating change, Moore's Law, the contextual change of innovation over time is happening at an extraordinary pace. Now here's what everybody doesn't tell you. Okay, everybody knows about exponential growth. But you always put it in your marketing plan, and you put in big data, and you put in an app, and you put in all this stuff because those are the those are the, the words like paradigm. Everybody used to say paradigm, you know, paradigm shift. But if you look at exponential growth, what we find is really interesting here is there are two spots in the yellow that are of considerable concern. If you look at a natural linear progression where you know you want five percent or ten percent growth, we can project that, and it can happen, and it's no big deal. But in the context of exponential growth, because it's a curve, what we find is an early trough. In other words, it goes below the linear projection or the standard projection or the conventional life science projection. And that's where your boss gets nervous. That's where people say, my God, this idea is working. And that's the area of disappointment. So in the context of exponential growth, you have to recognize that disappointment has to be baked in. It has to be baked in. And similarly, when you get to that, that peak or that accelerating point of return, two things happen there, depending upon if you're prepared. If you're not prepared, if you don't have enough of your supply side information or material, you can't meet demand and things start to fall apart, or you end up in this space of amazement. But either way, it's important to recognize that exponential growth and exponential change is not necessarily a fun ride. It's a frightening ride. And it's arrived, characterized by disappointment and the other D word that we hear all the time. And the other D word is disruption. That it's disruptive to the status quo. And we as humans, we as neocortical thinkers, that, that outside of our brain, likes predictability. That's why the linear model is, is just so fundamentally comfortable for us. So, that notion of disruption is not life science. It's happening all around the world. So whether we're leading or following is a good debate, but I would argue that in many instances, the life science industry is leading and failing in many instances. Um, the device industry in particular has real advances, amazing aspects of life-changing miniaturization that define the industry yet in other areas they're kind of behind the curve. But this reality is occurring in places like Uber. Think about it. The biggest hotel chain owns no property, right? Just a fundamental mismatch, what we understood. The biggest taxi cab company owns no taxi cabs. So this kind of fundamental shift is happening around the world and in places that are much more mainstream and consumer. So we as participants in the life science industry have to recognize that we are going in this direction and we're going to get there whether we walk that way, run that way, or come right yelling or screaming. And then the final reality, this notion of technology is becoming something that's so fundamental, so visceral that it reminds me 
of, of the guy named Abraham Maslow. And Maslow talked about the hierarchy of human needs, food, water, shelter, all those kinds of things. But in this instance, I think that, and this is actually a real picture of a guy who's self in sub-Saharan Africa, I would argue that food, water, shelter is intrinsic to our lives. But in some way, data, technology, the internet, is, is becoming so important to us. You know, if, you, if you're off to work and you forget your lunch, what do you do? You go to work, right? You figure you'll, you'll pick something on the road and you buy it. If you leave your house and forget your phone, you turn around and go back. You turn around and go back because it's just a fundamental aspect of our lives. That's why when we talk about technology, we talk about digital health particularly, it's much more of a broader psychosocial dynamic that is really overtaking the world that we live in. Now, I want to talk about why this is important. If you remember that slide earlier, we showed the Gutenberg Press, sort of the definitive moment in human civilization where information became available to the common person. Okay, some people call today a Gutenberg moment a little bit. I would disagree with that, because I think today is bigger than Gutenberg. Gutenberg was a sort of a single factor we're seeing this, this confluence of events that have never been seen in human history, and the changes are dramatic. And I want to walk you through an example, because I think it's very important for you to get a sense of this, a sense of the excitement, a sense of the enthusiasm, a sense of the wonder that's going on in the world today, because I'm going to go back to that thought. You're lucky to be alive today. So I believe that today is our inflection point, that when you look at that, that curve, it's really happening now. And it's not an arbitrary distinction. It didn't happen five or six years ago. Three or four years ago is another interesting dynamic, but it's really happening now. So I want to go back 100 years and put that in perspective, because if you don't put it in context, it kind of makes no sense. Go back 100 years ago. Anybody know what happened 100 years ago? Anybody? You know the answer. You can say it. Nothing. Exactly. Nothing happened. But if you go, if you talk fast forward a few years to 1916, 1915, you saw a tremendous emergence of important technological and social issues. Strife emerged around World War I, the Russian Revolution. The, the nature of, of suffering, there was conflict in the world that emerged right around this time. Innovation was very interesting because what happened is we saw the transformative power of science in our lives. That science was no longer part of that academic scenario, but it was our lives. We could actually measure the mass of an electron. 9.1 times 10 to the 31st kilograms. A seemingly insignificant number, but one that was profound that helped change the world. It became the notion of little data, of small data. And this other thing called Relativity, Einstein's special theory of relativity. These were some of the, the game-changing fundamental ideas. And what, what that made you feel is that science and technology was part of my life. Part of my life. And what developed from that was the key takeaway to this slide, and that's the sense of wonder. The sense of wonder. The washing machine, gas stoves, indoor lighting, refrigeration. These were things that fundamentally changed our lives. And it put us on a trajectory to a new century. The century began about 1917, 1918, 1916, somewhere right there. But that sense of wonder was manifest in one thing that I believe is the linchpin that I'm going to compare to next year. In 19... 17 or 1916, you had the opportunity to look up into the sky and see something. You could see an airplane. Now, I want you to think about that. You're a farmer in the field, and you see this kind of rickety airplane held together by glue and wood and paper, and it lands in your field. Do you agree with me there's a sense of wonder to that, this flying machine? I think that's a fair assumption. But you're also contrasted by that sense of, of fear. Would you let your kids go in there and go for a ride? Of course not. Of course not. So wonder was tempered by fear. The introduction of the airplane changed 
this century. And interestingly, what we do now is we see something as fearful in a sense of wonder is now one of the safest, at least from a crash perspective, <laughs> things to do in transportation. Finally, around this time, there was a new sense of social awareness. Child labor laws, women's suffrage, the ability to say that now I am part of society, I am an individual who is empowered as an individual, but also as a social collective. So at the beginning of the century, of the, of the 19th century, there's some fundamental game-changing ideas. And interestingly, when we jump ahead, we find a very similar pattern. So that being said, I'll ask the question again. What happened in the year 2000? Anybody? A little later, right? But Y2K, Y2K, exactly, Y2K didn't happen. Right? It didn't happen. So I argue nothing happened in the year 2000. Now I'm sure there's something. But what we saw was a little bit later, around 16, around 17. How old is this? It's 10 years old. Think of the world in the year 2000 versus the year 2007. This is launched. And now the year, just 10 years later, 2017. Look at the fundamental change in our lives. So I think that it's fair to say that in, in the year 2017, we saw an interesting emergence, parallel to 100 years ago, of this notion of strife. There is, without a doubt, a level of global strife emerging today. And I don't even want to talk about the geopolitics. Let's just talk about healthcare. Just talk about healthcare and see how that is ripe for either being disrupted or for disrupting. I'm not sure which way it's going to go. But the clinical perspective, to me, is very, very interesting. We are at almost a bit of a tipping point. Innovation is clearly a game changer, whether it be artificial intelligence, the notion of robotics, AI, um, small data, the massive electron, to big data. I'm going to talk a little bit more about big data, because big data is another one of those things that you kind of put in your marketing plan. It's, it's the dot com of, of, of yesterday. People say that our Business practice will leverage machine learning and big data to better target. But I think it is a very, very important aspect of the game changer. But there's this other thing. This sense of wonder is real and true, whether it be genomic analysis, whether it be holograms, personalized therapy. But what's emerging now, I believe, is exactly analogous to what happened 100 years ago. And that's the driverless car. The driverless car is here. It's on the road. It's a reality. Now, today, if a driverless car came, came to pick you up and take you to the airport, I, I think you'd have a sense of wonder. That's probably fair, right? But I don't know if you'd get in it just with a band. I, I've been in a driverless car. It's a little bit like driving in Europe when you're on the other side and you're sitting in the driver's seat for the drivers on the, and you're kind of looking and it's like this, this weird sensation. That's what the driverless car is. I think the driverless car provides a sense of wonder and a sense of fear and concern because it's evolving technology. But it's coming, it's coming extraordinarily fast, and what's going to happen is going to change the nature of car ownership in a huge way. Remember, Americans have a love affair with cars. Cars define our lives in so many ways. So as, as the driver of this car emerges, what we'll see is that it'll be the big game changer, and I think that's going to be the inflection that's going to be the aha moment for people to say, wow, the new century is here. Maybe to a degree 2007 was with the introduction of the smartphone, but I think the electric car, you know, the driverless car individually would be that point. Now here, here's the interesting point. Ten years from now, we're all going to come back at this meeting, and we're going to head out to the airport, and the driverless car is going to come to pick us up. But I'll raise my hand and say, uh, Chris, you mind if I drive you to the airport? And Chris will deny. He'll say no thanks. And you know why that is? It's too dangerous. It's too dangerous. Just as the airplane in 1917 was too dangerous, just as the driverless car today is perceived as well, kind of too dangerous, 10 years, just 10, that whole dynamic will be flipped on its head. And again, it's a 10x. It's a sort of a Google dynamic. It's where you're seeing it happening, not in 100 years, but in one-tenth of that in 10 years. So I think that the driverless car is going to be that game changer that mentioned.
change a lot of the way we think about the world and help us embrace technology. The other thing um, that's also happening is that sense of social awareness. We call it now, in the context of digital health, a quantified patient, quantified self. The patient's ability to either look at genomic analysis on a very technological perspective, or something as simple as how many steps I took today. The interesting thing about the trackers, and why I love them so much, is that the 10,000 step dynamic and the activity trackers are uniquely designed for people who don't need it. Okay? The 65-year-old man with metabolic syndrome on the couch is not going to put on an activity tracker. Why? Because today it exists as an athletic option versus a clinical imperative. And that's what we have to change. It's shifting that to a clinical imperative. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So I, I want to just go over sort of digital health abstractly and talk about, again, these things that are sort of a bit philosophical and how I believe they're going to impact our lives in medicine. So the interesting thing about digital health is that the future kind of is what it used to be. Nobody ever grew up worrying about, can I work with a five Tesla magnet to do an MRI? No kid thought about that, but every kid growing up watched the Jetsons. Every kid growing up learned about Dick Tracy and a watch that you could talk into, or a phone that had a video camera in it. So to me, I think that this is a very interesting psychodynamic that's helping drive the adoption of digital health. Yet the, the, real, the reality is that digital health is older than all of us that the application of technology to health is nothing new. This is from Medtronic, I think it's 1958, and this is a, a portable pacemaker. And you can see there's a metronome in there clicking back and forth, but this was digital health in, in its day, and, and quite successful and quite important. It launched a functional industry for Medtronic and a variety of companies. Today, it looks like this. Today, it's a leadless cardiac pacemaker put into the ventricular apex, it can be interrogated externally. I see a lot of heads nodding, so there's probably been trying people who are looking at this device. But it is very interesting to me, not only because it's easy and you just pop it in, but because it facilitates medicine at a distance, because you can actually use telemedicine, another engagement strategy, have someone in Europe or in Africa work with a physician on the other side of the world to help put this in, to help place it, even using robotics, and to interrogate it from around the world. So the technology of this is probably more vast and more interesting. The fact that it's little and tiny is the least significant of the innovation, the least significant. But it's the one that captures mind share. You know, and we're in the business of show business to a certain degree. So be, being able to capture mind share is very powerful. So it's old, it's been around, it's completely new. Anybody want to try to guess what this thing is? It kind of looks a little bit like it, what it might be. It's a kidney. It's a kidney grown in a lab. And this slide, this is from Beth Jarrett, um, is five years old. This picture is five years old. So the ability to grow organs changes the organ transplant dynamic. And here's what's going to happen. We're going to move from organ donors, to data donors, from organ donors to data donors. Big data is the next wonder drug. The ability to include data analytics using AI and a variety, variety of modalities is going to be that new domain. So I know I get a little lost and I get ahead of myself when I talk about decellularizing a matrix, growing cells on it. But right around the corner from there's a company called Human Longevity. Some of you might know that company. It was founded by Craig Bender, who was the first man to sequence the human genome. Interestingly, the other two guys that founded the company, nobody seems to know about which kind of irks me. The other guy is Peter Diamandis. Peter Diamandis is a uh, MD, PhD, went to MIT, went to Harvard, you know, one of these smart advanced guys. And Peter is the father of exponential innovation. The father of exponential innovation. Very, very interesting guy. Founded the X Prize as an example. The other guy is a guy named uh, Bob Barreri. Bob Barreri is the father of the human stem cell. He's one of the people looking at using stem cells in a unique way. Now, the interesting thing about Bob and what, what he's doing with his company, it's called Cellularity, is that while we will not become organ donors, we will become data donors, there is one organ that has vast biological properties that will become a wellspring for very powerful and special stem cells. Anybody want to guess what that organ is? It's the 
placenta. The thing we throw away. The placenta, placenta-derived stem cells will become a very, very powerful tool, even in the context of killer T cells and, and um, things like amino oncology. So that's just sort of kind of a sidebar. So it is completely new. Everything is changing. And ironically, it's kind of old. The activity trackers, or dust collectors as I call them, there's mine, I dusted them for the picture, um, are intended to be sort of this quasi-scientific instrument, almost a novelty. So originally, people thought about, oh, gee, if we can put, put an activity tracker on people, and then we can um, track, maybe, maybe we can make them, remind them to take their medicine or something. Maybe it's a compliance kind of issue. And that kind of failed miserably because if we look at the data, the interesting thing is that the compliance of the activity tracker itself is the same thing as compliance of like oral antihypertensive therapy. You know, that after six or eight weeks, people stop wearing their device, probably because they don't charge it. Once you don't charge it, it's this whole cascade of negativity. But the activity tracker does this, right? This is not clinical medicine. I'll show you what clinical medicine is. This is clinical medicine. Why not use the activity tracker, the three-dimensional accelerometer, to track gait and tremor to optimize therapy in Parkinson's and movement disorders? There's an example. What we did is we took existing technology. And remember, most of the technology is, is old. It's not new. Uber doesn't use anything new. You know, Amazon didn't really do anything new. They just created technology and used it in a new way. I mean, let's face it, anybody who's in the device industry no, it's all about what's in the can. You know, you take the can and you say, well, now it's in the chest, we're going to stick it in the back and let's see if we can change pain or continents. I mean, it's not the bashing of innovation or reality, it's just changing the existing modality. So if we can shift it from an athletic option to a clinical imperative, that's an exciting time. So activity trackers have life in them, but I think that we have to change them. Google is doing some interesting work with a new type of tracker. Apple is looking at trackers working with a live core to be able to track the occurrence of atrial fibrillation, a beating abnormality. They kind of sell it in the context of stroke, because that's you know the bad stroke which generally come from clots from AFib. So this whole notion was born, I think, on television. And the reason this is important is because physicians hate medicine right now. Ask a 50-year-old doctor if he or she would send their kid to medical school, and what would they say? Anybody? Well, what do you think the likelihood is? Pretty, pretty low, right? Don't go to medical school. Interestingly, though, as I see medical students, second, third, fourth year medical students, maybe interns and residents, they don't have that perspective on medicine. Maybe they're naive, but the real reason is, is because they grew up with this. They grew up with technology as their partner. So, they're not dinosaurs. Okay, they're not dinosaurs. You know how you can tell if you're a dinosaur? It's a very simple test. Do you wear a watch? If you wear a watch, you're a dinosaur. Because kids today tell time on their smartphone. They don't use a watch. It just makes no sense to them. But these medical students that I'm talking to, and interns and residents, were born with this idea of technology as part of their reality. So they look at technology as really going to change medicine, but make medicine better, and make it advance. And not, they're not encumbered by the intrusion of the EMR as a defining aspect of technology. So the reality is that that thing called the tricorder, the little scanner, is, is functionally here today in many different iterations. This is one that's interesting. It's called ScanDo. It's a device you put on your forehead and it measures skin galvanic response, EKG, using a single lead. It looks at blood pressure using something called the standing wave effect. Remember, most clinicians would tell you you could take blood pressure only by an indwelling catheter, arterial catheter, or a squeeze technology where you include the artery. So they're doing something different. They've struggled, they're having trouble, but there are a lot of people looking at the tricorder dynamic right now. And the point I'm making is failure is part of the process. And when we talk about Theranos and Elizabeth Holmes and some of the work done there, I mean, they sort of define failure. Failure not, not really in the context of bad science that went bad. I think their model was bad. I think there was probably a bit of flaw or corruption in this. But that's the nature of the business. I think the trick to getting around this notion of failure in the context of exponential changes to fail fast and be able to be quick and pivot. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. 
So I want to go over some of the trends in digital health. Clearly it's small, everything is small, smaller and smaller and smaller. In the device industry, this is no surprise. Okay? The device industry has really changed this. Now I don't know why they don't take credit for it. I don't know why they're not out there ahead of the curve owning this dynamic. I'll tell you, the real, one company that really owns this is the hearing aid companies. Companies like Sonova, Phonak. Starkey, these companies, number one, have an incredible miniaturization. The stuff they're doing now. Number two, the technology, whether it be the modulation of sound, the filtering of sound, the amplification of, of certain frequencies. Number three, the ability to move beyond that technology and create something like a, um, a cochlear implant. So I just wonder why some of these companies, and maybe those are, those are lessons for you too, is that why they're not ahead of the curve? Because in many ways, they are defining that dynamic. But small is interesting because small is only important. Small is only important when it's balanced by this other thing. Because if you don't make it small without making it more powerful, it doesn't matter. So smaller and smaller and smaller at the same capabilities doesn't do anything. And what this is really, this is the computing power of artificial intelligence with respect to the human brain. This is one example of what is huge in the world, but as we get smaller and smaller and smaller, our phones grow smaller and smaller and smaller, the ability to process information becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, and that's that two-way dynamic, that flux, that is really kind of the fundamental game for digital health. It's also meaningful. In other words, it's not just innovation for the sake of innovation. It's not taking a cardiac pacemaker, putting it in a smaller can, and stimulating the spine. But it, it, has, it has a greater level of social meaning. This is interesting. This is a, a little device that is an implantable sensor. Everybody knows about sensors. We have more sensors than we know what to do with. But this actually is used post-surgery uh, for cancer, removal of a tumor, and it's put in situ. It's put right in the tumor site, and it provides real-time biochemical measurement of certain elements, of certain compounds. So think about that. We could now sort of wait six months and get a scan to see if your tumor's back. Yikes, right? Or we can measure certain compounds, certain chemicals in real time. So I think that relevance is very, very exciting. This is being worked on by a variety of companies, but just an interesting way of taking sensors, and again, it's not a pulse oximetry device in a watch that nobody ever uses. Everybody has a pulse ox uh, uh, device that they can measure. But let's face it, everyone in this room's pulse oximetry is between 95 and 100 percent. If it was low, you'd probably be short of breath and lying on the floor. So pulse oximetry is an idea that gets thrown in because you can do it, it's cheap. These are ideas that move from arbitrary devices and arbitrary monitors to clinical relevance. It's hard. It's hard to do that, but it's important. And what this will give us is the opportunity of something called, that I call stage zero disease. Stage zero disease is one of the coolest things that drives the clinical imperative. So we spend all our money on end-of-life care when you're sick, when you're in the hospital. We spend very little money on low-risk prevention. Now, why do we do that? Well, the nature of the system, the nature of the billing, right? But you know what? Prevention is boring. Prevention is boring, and prevention is not being reversed. So it's, it's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. And, you know, let's go back to that 65-year-old guy with metabolic syndrome sitting on the couch, and we're going to use an activity tracker that instead of just giving him, gives him a shot, and it's going to get out and run, it's just not going to happen. Okay, it's not going to happen. The path to prevention is earlier and earlier and earlier detection. Now, hypothetically, just, just be whimsical for a second. Suppose we could find the first cancer cell in your body. Okay, it's not a practical binary, but I think, for example, it's interesting. If we could find the first cancer cell and kill it, what did we just do? What did we do? We took a disease at the earliest possible time, at stage zero. God forbid, we diagnose breast cancer stage three, four, four B. I mean, you use your hand to palpate a mass. That's the way to manage cancer in this technological society. It's absolutely crazy. It's barbaric. But if we can use technology to find that first cell, what we've done is we've shared a border with prevention. You know, it's that whole curve, if you study math, an asymptote, an asymptotic, perspective, we were right up against prevention. So the way to prevention is not eating spinach and exercising. The way to prevention is technology and early, early, early detection. Now, that's not to poo-poo prevention. It still has a role, but I think that's the nature of technology. 
So think about that mom who's 38 years old, status post mastectomy. She's home with her two kids, worried sick, every ache, every bump, every bruise. And her clinician says, I'm going to give you a little tracker. And we're going to inject in your body a little injection every six months of these nanoparticles. And they look for cancer. If they find it, it tags it, and it gets sensed by the <coughs> Think about that. Does she wear it, or does she let it collect dust by not charging it? You tell me. Right? You wear it because your life depends on it. In the same way, this is being done in the treatment of acute myocardial infarction. I mean, MIs are nasty things. If you're ever, if you're ever in the political arena and you're, you're in the emergency room and a guy comes in, his ST segments are through the roof, he's ashy, sweaty, looks like crap. Right? The most nervous person in that room is not the patient, it's the doctor. It, because this person is in crisis. They're very, very, very vulnerable. They can, they can have LV dysfunction, they can fibrillate, but it's really a crisis. But the interesting thing about an MI is that an MI is an event that occurs over time. It's not a threshold phenomenon. You have plaque developing, you have endothelial disruption, you have cracking, you have the release of thromboxanes. It's this whole complicated biochemical reaction. But if we could track that, we could track that and find out that this man at high risk, the guy on the couch, this is a guy with metabolic syndrome, who had an MI, if we can begin to track thromboxane, there are other biomarkers for platelet aggregation or endothelial disruption, we might get a week, a one week or two week window ahead of that. So this is work being done by Eric Topol at Scripps. Eric Topol wrote a great book called The Patient Will See You Now, uh, T-O-P-O-L, great book. It really puts into context the activation and the power of the people. So this is real science. Now, it's expensive, right? And everybody's going to come say, well, you know, no one's going to get this. It's too expensive. Who watched Wall Street? The movie Wall Street. Remember the phone? Remember Gordon Gecko was walking out on the beach with that thing? It was called the brick. And it was like $10,000. And I don't know, like $5 a minute. We all wanted it. But it was too expensive. But that's the nature of technology. Now, it's almost free in many instances. Same thing with the flat screen TV, especially for the guys in the room. Man, remember that, that 36 inch? flat screen TV that we all busted over for $8,000. Now, I don't, I'm not they're throwing them away. I drive down my street, I see them on the, on the side of the road. It's garbage. It's 50, 60, 70. So technology and cost is, is contextual in terms of information. But this notion of stage zero, I think, is another emerging trend that's very important. And the interesting thing is, it's not always going to be expensive. This is more work than at MIT, where they're looking at, at surrogate markers that, that you, you um, take a compound and it binds or chelates with um, other agents, with other, other, other markers, and you can determine some types of cancer potentially in a dipstick like pregnancy cancer. So again, this is still early science, but think about it in that context. It's like a pregnancy cancer. This is the liquid biopsy that we're all talking about. A company employer just got $350 million for some of their research about how we can use a liquid biopsy or a blood biopsy to determine cancer. Why? Stage zero. Stage zero. Real, it's, it's an important emerging trend. So everything is augmented today. Um, we live in an augmented world. I'm not going to talk deeply about, about cognition and AI, but I think it's an important kind of dynamic to recognize that we live in a world that will soon become less human, more technological, and then we even blur the distinction into a transhuman reality. Um, it's very interesting in philosophical times ahead. But AI is important. But AI frightens people because it's the evil, technologically mediated Uber or overlord or whatever. I don't think it's that, that case. I think it's probably best to switch the letters around. Don't think about it as AI, but think about it as IA. It's intelligence augmented. That's the dynamic that applies to clinical practice today. That I know that I'm going to go see this patient, and I'm going to do a history and a physical, I'm going to push and prod and check them out, but I'm also going to have my intelligence, my acumen, augmented by an x-ray. Or artificial intelligence going to listen to the history and physical and tell me that this patient is predisposed to a certain condition. Remember, Facebook can tell you if you're depressed. Facebook can tell you if you're depressed. You can use your voice modulation to determine Parkinson's disease. So these things are out there. They're happening really quickly. 
Augmented performance is not only the person with a spinal injury, it's a surgeon sitting in the OR who has a set of a harness on, on her legs so she can take the stress off her lower body and operate more exactly. It's a factory worker picking up a 100-pound box and avoiding injuries. Augmented reality is here as an emerging science. I know I'm running a little bit out of time, so I'm going to go a little faster here. Look at that lady. How many times have you done a, a marketing tool or a visual aid or you showed this person uh, uh, with that kind of level of enthusiasm or excitement over something? I'll tell you the secret about artificial um, uh, augmented reality is that this woman has experienced wonder and joy. Remember, we went back up about wonder. Wonder is that dynamic. But she's also experienced this grand sense of empathy. Think about someone who has a spouse with multiple sclerosis. Again, going back to that walk or that gait or that inability to move. I can now have a spouse experience that. Think about a daughter whose father has wet macular degeneration, has a narrow field of vision, and you want to convince him or not to drive. And you say, well, here you go. Put the glasses on. Go for a ride. So we're seeing tremendous opportunities to have patient empathy. It's not only just medical education and the tradition itself. It's really, really exciting. Therapy, similar in the same way if you're afraid to fly, pop this on, we take you for a ride on an airplane. The fourth interface, virtual reality is going to be the fourth interface, real quickly. Number one was the keyboard, right? The first pra practical or functional interface of the computer is we type stuff. The second was the GUI interface. The GUI interface was the mouse, point and click. The third interface was touch. But now we're going to be able to articulate. We're going to be able to move things around in space, and that fourth interface is going to be a, a fundamental game changer, whether it be gaming or in other aspects of, of what we do. Um, digital health is also defined as personal. I often spend a lot of time talking about genomics here because genomics is one slice. If you talk about personalization of medicine and only focus on genomics, you're missing the point. The point is it's a whole bunch of stuff, including things like the exposome, like what we're exposed to, the gut flora, right, the biome. So there's many aspects of personalization that's kind of coming down the pike. This is, this is just sort of a, a broad sw uh, swipe, and this is actually from, from uh, Eric Tilton's book. Data, as I said, is no longer a catchphrase. Data is real data is here. Data is the third fundamental window, third fundamental window into humanity. Data is extraordinarily important. The first window in from this guy named Copernicus who created a telescope. And he said, wow, it's not an Earth-centric world we live in. And it changed the perspective. Well, us tell us what the last one is, but I think that's a lesson learned. If we're going to do the open stars class. The second was the microscope, looking deeper into the cellular world and finding there's a whole broader reality. I believe that big data, the interconnectedness of humanity on all sorts of levels will become quite important, actually shift human evolution. It's that big a deal. So, so big data you know, is, is, is extraordinarily important only because we can now process it, we can track it, we can record it in, in like ways we couldn't do just five years ago. We didn't have enough storage, we have cloud storage now. Our processing speeds are so fast. We couldn't do that three years ago, five years ago. We certainly couldn't do it in the year 2000, but we can do it today. We can do it today. So data is a big, important dynamic. And the interesting thing is all going away that data acquisition will become more passive, that our chairs will have sensors in them. When I was at the Consumer Electronics Show, my most interesting conversation was with the guys at Lowe's. Not at J&J, not at Merck, it was with the guys at Lowe's, because we want to, they said, we want to put sensors in carpets so that we can track stuff, and track gate, and track room temperature, and tell you if someone's lying on the floor. We want to put sensors in the kitchen so we can orchestrate that dynamic with the refrigerator door opening and closing. We want to take those sensors and we want to put them in the bathroom so we can scan for atrial fibrillation in a bathroom mirror. So we can use the toilet as a repository and all sorts of biomarkers that we can somehow exclusively measure. They want to own that. And isn't it interesting when we think of innovation and health that comes from companies like Apple, or, or Google, or, or maybe even Lowe's, or maybe Kohler, will own the new sort of biotechnology because it's all going away. It's going from active data acquisition to passive data acquisition. We scan your data when you walk through an airplane. Good or bad, right? I'm not going to go on the bad side. But we scan for fever. If we're looking for, for Zika, we look who's febrile. Those people walk through a jet lag. 
It's collaborative, and collaboration is a very, very important point here. We're seeing collaboration across a variety of partners in this instance. It's people like Samsung and Nestle, or uh, Novartis, and, and, and um, other companies working on interesting devices. So I think eclectic innovation is a powerful tool that's happening more and more. And I just want to wrap it up a little bit here by talking about this notion of the digital collaboratory. The collaboratory. Because we define that. Everybody has their accelerator. J and J has an accelerator, Mars has an accelerator. Everybody has these things called accelerators. And I have a, a love-hate relationship with the accelerators because a lot of people try to apply a traditional model to an accelerator. That they put in, you know, a boss who's responsible to a more senior boss. And you know, it, it, the, the politics loom large in some of these things. They also feel that they need to have X number of ideas or do things in a certain way. My perception of a collaboratory or a collaborative environment is actually a mixing board. That you have to understand that if you're working with a company that might be stodgy, that you might have to dial up the innovation or dial up the notions of, of questioning authority. If you're working with a really innovative company, let's say you're working at Amazon, you might want to dial down in, in innovation, but you want to let them understand clinical data. Because those guys at Amazon, they kind of understand SEO and cloud computing, but they don't understand the dynamics of type 2 diabetes. So it's really a matter of mixing. And this is, I'm putting these next three slides in just, as, just real quick. I can send them to you if you like. But if you want to do it, you've got to really create that dynamic. The notion of openness, diversity, community, meritocracy. The idea is bigger than the politics. That there's activism, that you're changing the world, that there's meaning, there's autonomy. There's structure. Structure. I want five ideas that I want in one week. This stuff helps drive things around, as opposed to this whimsical, well, it's, it's a big, I don't know what the hell they'll do, but we'll check it out in six months. That notion of structure and serendipity, the notion of ignorance, I do not know what I do not know, is very, very interesting. The ability to experiment, the speed, pushing people along continuum, that trust and that sense of urgency, because this is something that's actually changing the world. So um, I'm going to kind of cut this short, but the collaborative, collaborative environment is very, very important and it's also doomed to failure. Because, and this is something that I wrote about, this collaborative era, because what we tend to do is take an intellectual average. So you want a red house and I want a white house. So we make a pink house, right? It's a failure. Failure. Because what we try to do is try to move everyone to the center. And the interesting thing is that the innovative idea often lies at the periphery. And the challenge is to move all those people to the periphery to shift them out. And that, that's really the, the first area of, of, of collaborative killing that happens. The second one is we expect the innovator to be like Elon Musk. We expect the innovator to be like a Jeff Bezos or, or Steve Jobs. We expect them to be bold and arrogant and definitive and know what they want. And then, then we as sheep can rally around the innovator. The problem is innovation is Innovation is extraordinarily fragile, and sometimes someone with a great idea, like Nikola Tesla, the great scientist who invented alternating current, was squashed by Thomas Edison, was squashed by Westinghouse because he was a fragile soul with a special idea. So those two areas, that notion of collaboration and intellectual average, as well as nurturing the right idea, is, is very, very tricky. That's why a lot of collaboratories in the life science industry are sort of a kind of mushy, you know, because they seek to the mushy, the mushy middle where innovation doesn't live. So one concluding thought um, is that we talked about 100 years ago. We talked about 10 years from now where the, where the driverless car kind of changes the dynamic. I want to just talk about Ray Kurzweil, a, a brilliant futurist. And he said something that I thought was extraordinarily resonant. He said that blah, 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 the next 100 years will bring with it the advances equal to the last 20,000 years of human civilization. The last 20,000 years of human civilization. So we are in for a ride, and that, that ride is not something that is, it's not something that is outside of our domain, it's not something that is science fiction, it's not science future, it's science today. And that the next 100 years is a vista that we may share. A girl born today has a one in three chance of living in 400. A one in three chance. 
And interestingly, it's been said that the first person who lived to be 150 is alive today. And the interesting thing is, it might be one of you. So, thank you all very much.